Hi everyone, Heather here from the California After School Network with Michael Funk from the California Department of Education. Uh, thank you all for joining us today in our series of virtual fireside chats. This week we are very excited to be joined um, by some of our outstanding partners here in Sacramento. So we have Jason and Monique from the Sacramento Chinese Community Service Center and Dr. Gondina, who is the principal for Washington Elementary School. So welcome to the three of you. Happy to have you with us this week. And last, um, in our last fireside chat, we actually talked about the wind that after school expanded learning was really fortunate this year um, to receive. We did receive level funding in this year's state budget and program flexibility through the budget trailer bill language. Basically, everything that we asked for, we got. Um, there's still a lot of challenges ahead, but we are very um, fortunate and thankful for everyone who advocated on behalf of our program um, to get us those wins. But despite those wins, many things remain uncertain, especially this week um, as more things begin to reclose. Um, and we know that there are a lot of challenges for our programs to navigate through these times. Um, yet, as we continue to say, as Michael always says, um, inaction is causing harm to our students. And so we really wanted to bring on some folks today that could talk to the actions that they are taking uh, to support their students. And so in addition to program guidance coming from CDE, we will be using this platform today and over the coming weeks to highlight programs that are engaging and in lead, leading these conversations about what school and expanded learning look like this fall and over the next school year. Um, so Michael, before we jump into that conversation, I'm wondering if you can um, share any, uh, any updates on incoming questions. I'm sure you have been flooded with them or any updates on the additional guidance that's to be released by CDE. Well, first of all, I want to uh, just for full disclosure, um, Washington Elementary, where Dr. Godina is principal and where the center runs the after school program is my daughter's Janae's school. She'll be going into fourth grade this, this fall in some way as she might not make it far past our, our kitchen table for the first few weeks, but she will be headed into fourth grade. So I'm just so proud of, of it's a, just a phenomenal school and phenomenal people. And um, I wanted to just bring them on. Um, and I, we need to acknowledge yesterday was a difficult day for, for many of us who had some higher hopes of things, at least going to a hybrid model uh, for our children to come back and, and be together. And now it's just a lot of uncertainty exactly four months to the day, Los Angeles Uni uh, Unified announced it was going distance learning. And a joint announcement with San Diego, I heard this morning that in actuality, the full story did not quite make the newspapers, but that San Diego, as of this morning, what I heard is San Diego was closing for a week, doing distance for a week and then going to assess. We're gonna hear versions of this, uh, we're gonna hear media reports, we're gonna hear school closers, um, but all, all the more important to bring in front of you some leaders in education here in Sacramento that are committing to work together and dialogue through all the disruption and there'll be more disruption to come, uh, the strength of a community partner. So as we talked about last week, there are several things that we are that we're in uh, SB 98, section 97. And um, we are, have developed guidance. That guidance is currently in review in the legal department. It's taking a little bit longer than, uh, not that we expected, the legal department's getting flooded with everything. So it, it'll be out soon in the next couple of days. But in the meantime, I really felt it was important to bring up a couple examples and then bring in front of you uh, real life examples of what the, what the flexibility looks like in action. But first of all, as you might recall, one of the sections of Ed Code that was waived in SB 98 was the section that described the hours of the elementary and middle school programs run, need to operate. So they need to start when school is over and go until 6 p.m. There's a longer section of Ed Code. 
Uh, but even with that, it seems like there's a lot of questions popping up. Like, well, does that mean we still need to run three hours or can I start at two? Or what if I wanna go one hour on this day? Or what if I need to go two hours in the morning and one hour in the afternoon with another subset of kids? And all that is flexible. I just wanna reiterate, it is all flexible. Um, we of course want you to keep track of the kids that you serve. We haven't quite figured out how grantees will enter their attendance into our database. Uh, for many of you, that's not an issue, but if you are the direct grantee and fiscal, uh, then you'll need to figure out how to translate those attendance sheets into um, the database. So I'm not gonna get into more details, but we will be convening some type of attendance focus group in the next week or two to include CDE staff and field staff to talk through this issue so we're, we make sure we don't have any unintended consequences. But if you are planning on serving children, whether virtually, distance, um, or in person, then you'll need to be ready to track their attendance. <clears throat> Just to be clear, of course, the attendance does not count, uh, will not be counted towards some type of grant reduction if you don't meet your numbers. The grant reductions have also been suspended for this year. So that's as far as I'm gonna go on this guidance. Let's turn it over to uh, Jason and Monique from the center to start. Tell us about what you've, what you've been talking about, what you've been planning. Yeah, well, thank you, Michael, for having us uh, aboard. We're excited to be here. And obviously we've been immersed in this work for a while. And, um, you know, like everybody else, we're, you know, scrambling for information and that information continues to change daily. And we've had, you know, to have conversations around how we're going to continue to adapt to our new surroundings. And I think that's really been the center and the focus of our conversations with our leadership teams uh, here at the center. We're excited about what the future brings to us because this has been a gift, I think, this flexibility that we have. I think it's, it's built in for us a seat at the table that I think you know, a lot of programs sometimes struggle with because of the lack of flexibility that we had in programming traditionally and uh, you know how much focus we've had as a, as a field on compliance. So when I look at the opportunity that we have right now, you know, we're, we're able to, to get us to the table at school sites where we can have authentic conversations about how to truly support students. Absolutely. I'd like to second that. Hi, everybody. My name is Monique. I work for the Sacramento Chinese Community Service Center here in Sacramento, and I'm the coordinator um, for several of our uh, after school and expanded learning programs, in fact. Um, and I work closely and directly with Jason, and he's my director. And um, I'm also the advocacy lead for our agency and one of our custodian of records. So, yes, we're a nonprofit. We wear many hats. Um, but this is indeed an exciting time for us. We've always kind of wanted um, to be, uh, you know, brought to the table and to actually have our ideas welcomed more into streamlining with the school day. So I find that this is a really good opportunity for us to strengthen our partnerships that we have with our principals, admin, the district, and the community overall. Thank you to both of you. And Dr. Godina, um... Since the first time I talked with you, I've sensed your passion and your commitment to put the children first, but also deeply supportive of your staff and your community partners, and so committed to the whole child. So tell us, tell us what is your vision for moving forward? Um, well, well, first, also thank you for having me on this panel um, of experts. Um, I mean, I can speak for myself and, you know, for the Washington community here in, you know, Midtown Sacramento. Um, you know, I don't, I don't want to, you know, gloss over that, you know, our, com our community is in a lot of pain and in a lot of need right now. And, you know, as the leaders of our schools, you know, it's on us to be that voice of calmness and, you know, um, being able to bring something that is academic but that is also in service of our kids given our times right now and so when i think about you know just all of the rapid changes happening with with covid right now and we're going back in person kind of but now we're not just that unknown space 
Um, we just really have to be super intentional with our community right now. And always, you know, we, we learned a lot from, you know, how we did school in March, April, May, June, that was, you know, a lot of flying by the seat of our pants. And, you know, thankfully we have a strong team of teachers who got it done, you know, but I think what we learned was that we were trying to recreate school, but we weren't in school. And, you know, this is an opportunity for us now to, you know, how can we design school, you know, for the reality that our kids are in, given everything that has happened this summer and happening right now, um, so that we're not returning to like the normal, right, but to something better. Um, you know, and so I think just these changes that you mentioned with SB 98 really is a game changer, you know, for being able to work with, um, in our case, SAC Chinese, our STEAM Academy program, and how can we now, you know, because we're thinking now about like, how do we make school different in service of our students, you know, who will be coming back to school with higher levels of trauma, um, you know, mental health needs that are now exacerbated um, because, you know, they will have not been in school for the last five, six months. And so this is really going to allow us the flexibility, whether it's online or in person, to be able to work more directly in service of our students, our teaching staff and our expanded learning staff. Like we're one and the same. We're, 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 you know, we're doing the same service for our kids. Did you hear that, ladies and gentlemen? Yeah. <laughs> our teachers and our after school staff. So that's kind of my vision. One in the same. That's exactly what you're speaking to, Jason and Monique. So one of the, one of the things that I want to do through this is now to ask you to get a little bit more specific. So what are some of the concrete design elements that you've been talking about? And I, I realize, okay, Sacramento hasn't made an announcement yet. Uh, so at, as of this moment, there's still some kind of hybrid model on the table and that will come back at some point. So let's talk about whether it's distance or hybrid. What are some of the specific elements of the design that you're talking about that are possible because of the flexibility? Sure. Well, you know, right now, you know, you're really looking at three options and that's either that we'll move forward with some kind of a distance learning model. We'll have some kind of an in-person model or there will be a hybrid between the two. And so those three options, I think, have kind of centered our thinking in what our approach is going to be uh, in the fall. But even in the summer here, uh, we're looking to run some summer programming here. And so even though we're talking about reopening schools in the fall, there are a lot of schools that are getting ready to kind of do a pre-reopening uh, with summer programming, getting students a little bit more acclimated to what distance learning might look like in the fall. And I think for us, you know, we, we've got a couple of guiding statements or principles that, that we've really dialed into. And that's one that there's not a one size fits all approach to what we're going to do. And so we have to kind of step outside of the box of, of what our field has been used to. How many students can we get into a program? That's not really what we're looking at right now. We need to start looking at, at our other guiding kind of statement, which is, you know, quality over quantity. So how do we create quality programs and how do we customize or tailor fit our programming to meet the needs of our school sites? I've worked for the Sacramento Chinese Community Service Center for the last 17 years, and I can tell you that our approach has always been customize our programming to fit the needs of our school sites. And sometimes we have to do that within the constraints of compliance. But right now, we have what I've been telling people is the golden ticket. We have an opportunity right now to rethink what after school looks like in the state of California and maybe throughout the nation and to really develop and design programming that is meeting individualized needs on campuses. And we can look at that through a lot of different lenses, but this relaxation in, in compliance for us, uh, this flexibility, like I said earlier, has given us a seat at the table to sit down and have really authentic conversations about what is the vision of, the, of any particular school. What are the milestones that we're looking to, you know, uh, to achieve together? 
And how do we approach that using ACES funding? And in some cases, using that maybe even in a blended funding model to supplement programs that are going to make a big difference. Focusing in on some of the insecurities that our families have, whether it's you know food insecurities or other shelter insecurities, whatever that looks like. We have some time right now to really dive in and find resources that families need to continue to be resilient in what is considered our new normal. Uh, so we're really approaching it from a quality standpoint. Uh, we want to approach it to make sure that we're meeting the needs of the students who are most in need of these programs. Monique, what comes to your mind? Well, I was just thinking about the fact that um, what Jason was talking about, tailoring the program specifically to what each individual school needs, as well as what is the district needing? Um, we're hearing some districts are going full distance learning. Well, then that means that our program is going to have to cater to those schedules and assist where we're needed there. We're hearing some blended models where we might be at school for um, students maybe in school for four hours a day and then maybe expanded learning can start after that. And in addition to that, if the school isn't planning on starting until 9 a.m. and we have some parents that we know we need to get back to work full time, but there's a possibility that we can run something um, in person um, before school and then also run a little bit after school. And then maybe the next day is the whole school's day off where they're doing cleaning, collaboration. We would definitely be a part of the collaboration with admin and teachers on those days as well. But we would offer also like to offer some sort of distance learning and a distance expanded learning program for the students to attend to in addition to whatever they're doing at home. So this flexibility is allowing us to really specifically cater our programs to what our districts need, what our specific school sites need, um, in addition to the different models that are being offered at the schools. If it's a STEAM-based focused school, we have, the, we have the great flexibility to focus on STEAM. Um, if it's a Waldorf model, we have some ideas on how we can shift Waldorf into um, on, into on an online platform as well as in an in-person with distancing. So all of these ideas are so exciting because we hadn't been able to think or actually put those into place in the past. And this is a, this is a time for new development, new innovation. It shall not be a time for us to really stop. This is a time for us to continue and keep the ball rolling and, and have these great creative ideas. And I think understandably, everybody's gonna understand that not everything is gonna be perfect but we are going to kind of have to learn as we go along, considering this is a new type of way of school. Dr. Godina, you and I have had many conversations. Um, when we talked about the ACES program funding coming to your school this year for the first time, you were really articulate and passionate about really bringing a whole suite of services, a whole kind of wraparound services for the children uh, as part of this. So you want to say a few words about that? Um, yeah, it really came as a surprise to me that we were that we qualified for the ACES funding and really thankful because I felt like, you know, during a time where nobody's talking about having extra funding here, we were talking about having additional funding and it was a really good space to be in. It still is. Um, you know, I I don't know all the all the rules and all the technicalities, and I think that that's been a good thing because I'm I don't feel constrained by them. Um, you know, I think at the end of the day, you all want schools to build good programs, and we know how to build good programs because we know our community and we know the needs of our kids. And so, in talking to you about that, you know, I just I I wished, you know, I made a wish list, and you know, and I dreamed, you know, and so with this now can we really start to service what the actual needs of our kids were and, you know when we think about washington this school located in you know downtown sacramento so close to loaves and fishes and you know communities of high need you know the first thing that came to mind was mental health right now can i bring in a social worker that can you know start to address the needs of my students because we don't have that kind of funding in our in our regular budget um you know, and just other other things that we where we could integrate, you know, more arts, you know, and murals and things like that. Just all the richness, you know, that our kids, you know, should be exposed to. Um, and so, you know, being able to talk about those things with you 
you know, was great. You know, we didn't expect to shut down a few months later, but, you know, we were able to order, you know, and do a lot of those things and have those projects now pending um, so that we can, you know, we can do it once, you know, once the time is right. I just want to say for the record, for the record, I personally had nothing to do with my daughters oh. <laughs> getting an ACES grant. And I was unaware that the principal didn't know the rules. So I'll make sure that we correct both of those. <laughs> um, no, that's great. I, I, I love that you are not, you know, I, I talked a couple of weeks ago about the difference between being a system that's rule, rule bound or child centered. And being rule bound is, is, is uh, you know, I mentioned a couple of weeks ago that the pyramid of white supremacy and being rule driven and rule bound is on the pyramid. Um, starting with the rules versus starting with what children, the humans, the families actually need and then figuring out how we can get there. That's where we want to go. And that's what I appreciate about what you're, you're talking about. Heather, we've, we uh, probably need to start to wrap. Do you want to start? Yeah. To close yeah. So I um, have kind of a closing out question for our guests and then we'll fully wrap up. And so um, first I'll start with you, Monique and Jason, and with all the flexibility that we've kind of had in the interim and now that we know we have over this coming year, we've heard a lot from program providers about um, kind of some of the fear paralysis, right? There's so much that you could do that not even knowing where to start and wanting to make sure you do the right thing, but there's almost like the guardrails are gone. So how do you do the right thing? And so if you had one piece of guidance for your fellow program providers of, you know, just where might you start? How do you make that first move? And you, you all have shared a lot of great things about guiding principles and, you know, quality and individualized needs. Um, but if, yeah, starting with you, Monique, one, if you had one piece of advice for other programs to get started. Um, I know this seems like a hard concept to ravel through for some people, but planning, even though you know that plans may change, isn't completely a lost cause because we're used to already being so flexible when it comes to our programming and and everything that's involved in that so if we begin with a wonderful concept if we have to then take that concept and reshape it so it can be a virtual platform then at least we have a foundation where we can start from but if we don't start the ball rolling and thinking and coming up with ideas and having conversations with you know, our, our team leaders, our program managers, our directors, our principals, our, our plant managers, then, you know, then, then of course we're definitely at a standstill. So I think it's really important to reach out to all of our integral partners, as well as paying attention to the guidelines and figuring out where and how your program can fit into those guidelines. And then let's push the boundaries a little, you know, so be afraid to do that. Yeah, I would agree. I would agree with Monique. I mean, I think we as providers need to take a step back and, and remember why we got into this work in the first place. And we got into this work in the first place because we wanted to make a difference in students' lives and the community. And I think right now we've been, we've been given this gift of flexibility. And with that gift comes an incredible, you know, responsibility that we need to be able to go to the table. And we have a built-in seat at the table right now because of this flexibility. And I think providers need to understand that. And they need to think a little bit differently than they have in the past and reach out to their stakeholders or reach out to the principals. Start with where your strong relationships are. Where are your strongest relationships and start building out from there. And I think that you know when we, when we first started discussing this opportunity, in Sacramento to run summer programming. I mean, I couldn't think of a better school to do it at than Washington. We have this wonderful built-in relationship. We have like-minded, um, you know, thoughts about programming and how we want to assemble and reach our audiences, our clients. And that's where we have to start in that kind of reciprocal relationship and start bouncing ideas off of one another. Because right now it's really about what can we do? 
And that's really, I think, the question that we need to be asking ourselves. What can we do? And there, were, there are some restrictions. I mean, you do have only so much funding. But you have to figure out how you're going to use that funding to now create whatever this new programming is. But what a wonderful challenge to have. I mean, I can't think of a, of a better challenge in after school. And we've dealt with a lot over the years. And now here we are with complete flexibility and funding. And for programs who have struggled in the past, this is your opportunity right now to right the wrong. You have an opportunity right now to fix whatever challenges you've had in the past that have kept you from certain compliance pieces and, uh, and really run with, with those parts of your program that, that, that really work well for the community and then layer that and build upon that. Thanks, Jason. And Dr. Godina, to you, lastly, um, just from the perspective of a principal, we know not all principals, not all school districts have um, brought their expanded learning partners to the table. So if you had some advice to your counterparts about, you know, the value of bringing in expanded learning from the beginning, add a thought or two that you would like to share. Yeah. Um... I think it's all in the way we, we view, you know, what is in front of us. Um, I could look at my program, I could look at, you know, SAC Chinese, or as we call it, STEAM Academy, as our before and after school program, and end it at that. Um, and it'd be great, you know, we're servicing our families. But, or I could look at it as I have a coordinator who is an administrator, who is on my campus all day. Um, and really she's like my right hand person. Um, and I could view her through the lens as there's another person who can totally help me run this school because we're working with the same kids, who brings you know enough staff that essentially doubles our school staff. We all know our same kids by name. They love our kids just as much as the teachers. Like we're the same community. And so this is the opportunity in and just in the way I'm looking at at my program, like it's one in the same. Like th there is no need to have that that divide. Um, and I think once that clicked, just with myself, I just saw the possibilities of like, wow, we can really build a program here. Um, you know, we're not in the space obviously that we're used to. It's uncomfortable right now, but we can still build a program. Our kids are still there. Our families are still there. The teachers are still there. Our staff is still there. You know, so we can still do this. Yes, we can. Awesome. Yes, we can. Thank you. That that was wonderful. And thank you to all three of you for sharing your your passion um, for this work is evident, and your care for the students in the community um, is very evident. So thank you for all that you are doing. Thanks for joining us today. Um, and to everyone that's watching, I would just, you know, continue to ask questions, ask questions of us, ask questions of others um, to really just keep moving this work forward. And then share your stories, um, share what you are doing, what you, how you have been able to support your communities and share that with your school district, your community, your community leaders, the state, um, the legislator, the governor, everyone needs to hear about the good work you're doing. Um, and at the end of the day, just, do something. You sh your work should be centered on the kids you serve. So um, asking yourselves, how are you helping or harming your communities during this time? Um, so with that, I will turn it over to Michael for last words. Yeah, so you could expect some guidance coming from us. We haven't talked much about the financial guidance. Things like the 85% of the grant needs to still go to direct services to the children at the school. Uh, that the grant was assigned to those are, those things have not become flexible uh, we haven't opened up flexibility so the money can go be used anywhere this is still expanded learning funding uh, for the mix uh, so you can expect to see some of that coming out so jason said it earlier <clears throat> i said it last week with flexibility comes great responsibility the flexibility is designed to allow you to step up the game not step back and our children, every child deserves our best. Every child in California deserves your best and my best. And when I'm bringing myself to do this policy work and advocacy work here at CDE, 
I'm keeping that child that needs my best in the front of my mind. And will you join me in doing that? Our children need our best. Thanks all to our panel. You're amazing. I wish I could have said I scripted that, but I didn't. It was just amazing. So thank you very much for all you're doing. And we'll see you next week. Thank you. It was an honor. Bye.